Hey everyone, thanks for being with us today. If you're new to New Day and just tuning in for the very first time, welcome. We are midway through a study of the book of Joshua from the Old Testament. But before we dive back into it, I do have a couple of announcements for you. First off is that next Sunday, March 21st, will be our next in-person worship gathering down at our office and meeting space known as The Hub down in Browns Point. That'll be at 10 o'clock on Sunday morning. And you can now register to save your spot for that at newdaynw.com. Seating is somewhat limited, so we do really need for you to let us know if you'd like to be there. The second thing that I wanted to let you know about is that you can also register for our Easter service, which will be April 4th. And that is going to be held at the Federal Way Community Center. Today, though, I have asked my good friend Bill Bedell to pray for us. Bill and Christy and their family are, are just such an important part of the New Day community. We love them, and Bill has had such an influence and impact on so many lives through his counseling. And so it's great to have him be the one to open us up in prayer today. Would you join with him as he leads us to the Lord? Hey, guys. Uh, Jeff asked if I would possibly do the prayer for the sermon today, so I was happy to do that. If you join me in prayer, uh, we'll do that, and then we'll get to what Jeff's going to do today. God, uh, I just want to thank you for New Day. Uh, I want to thank you for the people that are in it, and that um, I'm so grateful for the community that we have. It's really a unique community full of people who um, love each other and can be real and are there for each other. And even in the midst of COVID being real difficult, painful, hard, and really disruptive to the relationships that we have, um, not only with each other, but with ourselves, with you, um, it's good to know and hopeful to know that we will be able to get back together and encourage each other and hold each other up, especially as this wave of emotion and grief comes from getting back into life, which is going to feel real good, but also bringing up some of the pain that we've all been experiencing during this year. So, um, God, we know that you are in the center of all of these things, holding us all together. And I pray that you would just make yourself even more tangible and known to us, um, that you would comfort us and soothe us and give us relief uh, as we struggle and um, for all our families, that you would just hold us strong and intact, able to get through these next months and get back to whatever normal life is going to look like. And we pray this all in your name. Amen. All right, new day. Take care. I read this story in the news this week about this guy from Connecticut who went to a yard sale and bought this blue and white bowl for $35. Now, if that had been me and I'd been there, I probably would have passed it up because I would have thought, oh, that seems a little steep for a yard sale find. But he bought it and he took it home and then he called Sotheby's auction house and he asked them to appraise it. And they estimated the value of this bowl to be up to half a million dollars. Turns out that this bowl is the only one of its kind known to exist in the United States, and there are only six of them in the entire world. And I think about the original owners of this bowl and how they came to price it at $35. It's, they're just discarding it. It's, it's clear that they have no sense of the priceless nature of the object that's in their hands. And I think sometimes the way that we relate to the story that we're looking at today is similar. The story of the Battle of Jericho. You know, when you're a kid, it's a great story. You got the song, Josh fought the Battle of Jericho. Come on, sing it with me now. Everybody's marching around the city and the walls come tumbling down and it's fun. And, and you read about God's miracle there and it's a big story and um, lots, of, lots of action. And so it's, it's great as a kid. But then as you start to get older, you read this story through more grown-up lenses and 
it starts to feel a little bit uncomfortable because you look at parts where God's instructing his people to decimate the entire population of the city. And they're not supposed to leave anybody alive. And, and that starts to sound more like ethnic cleansing or genocide. And we're not sure what to do with that. And it feeds into this larger question about how we relate the God of the Old Testament to the God of the New Testament. Because in the Old Testament, he seems so angry and judging and violent and severe and harsh. And over in the New Testament, we've got Jesus who seems so compassionate and kind and forgiving and peaceful and loving. And we don't know how to fit those two things together. So when we get to a story like Jericho, we just discard it or devalue it. And I'd like to restore its worth to us a bit because I think it's a priceless story on so many levels. But before we get into that story today, I do think it's worth taking a few minutes just to talk about this concept of the Old Testament God and the New Testament God and, and how they fit together. Because I absolutely believe we're talking about the same God here. And I realize that uh, in just a few minutes, we're, we're probably not going to adequately answer all your questions. But I do think there are a few things we can say uh, to, to help give us a broader understanding of the connection. What we're dealing with is God's holiness. That is the root behind everything. It's not that God is angry. It's not that God is uh, just this explosive kind of deity. It's that he's holy. And anything that is unholy cannot bear to be in his presence very long. And when we look at the land of Canaan and what was going on and all the different people groups that were part of it there, including Jericho, uh, they were steeped in wickedness. We know from archaeological records and their own, their own writings that the culture here was very dark. They had mingled their religion with gross sexual immorality to a point where it warped their understanding of who God was. And not only that, they were engaged in these debased and dehumanizing practices like child sacrifice. And so there was just rampant evil in this culture that had been going on for a really, really long time. And part of God bringing his people into this land was not only to give them a place, but also to rid the land of this scourge that had been there. And, and yet, as God is, is instructing his people about what they will do as they move into the land, he, he warns them that this same kind of judgment can fall on them as well. In the book of Leviticus, he, he outlines a number of the things that have been going on there. And then he tells his people this. Take a look at Leviticus chapter 18. He says, Do not defile yourselves in any of these ways, because this is how the nations that I'm going to drive out before you became defiled. Even the land was defiled. So I punished it for its sin, and the land vomited out its inhabitants. In other words, the harshness that we see, it's widespread and applies to, to everybody indiscriminately because God is a holy God, and his standard is his standard all the time. Now, the thing is, though, that is only one side of him. His holiness is only one aspect that we see in the Old Testament, because right there alongside that, we also see that God is loving and compassionate, all the things that we see in the New Testament. His people acknowledge that that was true about him. In Lamentations, we're told, The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. They were counting on that quality to be true about God. And this is how God identified himself. After he had given Moses uh, the law, he passed in front of him. And here's what he said to Moses. And he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. This is how God wants to describe himself. As he's talking to Moses here, he, this, is, 
This is the first thing out of his mouth about who he is. And yet in the same breath, he follows it up with this. He says, yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. In other words, God is both things. He is both loving and compassionate and he is holy and righteous. Those coexist in God. And when we see him uh, carrying out his judgment, it's not, it's not stemming from his volatility or his, his anger. It's coming from his holiness and it's being applied differently in different times, but ultimately uh, no individual people group is being singled out. Whoever is coming into contact with God outside of his will is going to have to uh, pay these prices. And even his own people are going to come up against the same costly form of judgment when they rebel and, and go against him. So in, in some senses, we can see that the, the harshness of God in the Old Testament is actually much further reaching than we might think because um, it's very universal in the fact that God is always holy in all situations. And so it is the, the ultimate form of justice that he is carrying out because it is based out of his own character. And even as he is executing judgment, it's worth noting that there is mercy in it. And we might not see that on the surface here in Jericho, but if you go back to when God first promised the land to Abram, and he said, this is where your descendants are going to come, back here to Canaan. When he told him that, he also said he wasn't going to give him the land right away. He was going to wait. It was going to be much later, 400 years later, that that would happen. And here's why. Look at what he said to Abram. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here. For the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. What's he saying here? He's saying your offspring are not going to come take over the land for a while yet because I want to give as much time as possible for these Amorites to get their act together. They haven't quite pushed the limit as absolutely far as I'm willing to go with them. So I, I want to give them some space here to turn around and repent. So he gives them this 400 year window. And still, they don't do it. They don't change their ways. And finally, God says, enough is enough. But even as he is carrying out his judgment, we can see that it was full of compassion and leniency and mercy that reflects that true character, that, that love that he says is at his very heart. So that gives us a little better perspective on the God of the Old Testament. But I think what's even more powerful is to see how this impacts our view of the God of the New Testament. Because we look over there and we see readily that Jesus is forgiving and compassionate and kind and all those things. But what about this judgment piece? Well, everything that we see in these incidents in the Old Testament, it comes into the New Testament. Judgment is still there, but it all falls on Christ on the cross. He bore our sin. He carried our punishment. All of that fell on him. So holiness comes to us through Christ in the New Testament and it funnels down to us in the form of grace. So we are able then instead to, to live in the fullness of God's love without fear because Christ has taken all the punishment on our behalf. So when we read a story like Jericho and we see all that brutality, that should be a sobering reminder to us of all that Christ took on on our behalf. Because if it weren't for him, that would be our fate as well. And so this story can serve to increase our gratitude and our appreciation for all that's been done for us on our behalf. So that to me is, is how I see the, the constancy of God between the Old Testament and the New Testament. His character hasn't changed at all. It's just the drastic difference that Jesus has made for us in the New Testament. Well, I want to shift gears here now to the, the battle itself and look at ways that we can uh, take lessons from this to apply to our own 
lives because really we're all engaged in a battle of one form or another, sometimes on multiple fronts at any given time. Just living right now seems like such, such a struggle. I just saw a headline in the Atlantic that said, late stage pandemic is messing with your brain. Every day, each and every single day is a fight. It's a fight for our mental health, for our concentration, to just clear away the fog so we can get through a day. And then you layer on top of that all the, all the ongoing stress that we're dealing with, whether it's broken relationships or work stuff or financial stress, family stuff. It just goes on and on and on. And we start to feel embattled, don't we? That's kind of a, an ongoing sense is that we are embattled. So how does this ancient battle that the Israelites faced at Jericho, how does that speak into our lives today? That's, that's what we want to explore together. And what I want to do is I, I thought that it might not be that dynamic to have me read this whole story on video for you because it's a pretty lengthy story. So I thought instead, let's have you pause the video and read it on your own. Read from Joshua 5, 13 down through Joshua 6, 27. And if you're watching together with other people, maybe you can take turns reading verses out loud or just watch this by yourself. Uh, see what you notice about the passage and then come and restart the video and uh, we'll make some observations together about how this might speak into our lives today. This story starts out with this incredible encounter between Joshua and the commander of the armies of the Lord. You can just picture it as, as this man is standing there with his sword drawn and Joshua is immediately on high alert. And he says, okay, whose side are you on, ours or theirs? As if that's the choice. And I love, I love the commander's response when he says, neither one, neither one, I'm here with God. And I think that is just a good reminder because so often when we are engaged in a struggle, we can have entirely wrong perspective as to what the struggle is even about. And we, we really want to look to God for our validation, to have him back us up. But God isn't our wingman. God is not here to be on our side. We are to, to place ourselves on God's side. And it is just a, a, a good reminder to be cognizant of that. As we get locked into things to go, okay, am I making this all about me when really God has a different point of view on what's even happening here? And this commander instructs Joshua to take off his shoes. And he says, the ground that you're standing on is holy. And, and Joshua does that and responds to that. But I was thinking about that land that he's actually on and going, this is the very spot where the battle is going to take place. This is going to be a costly spot. Even though, even though God will bring the walls down, there is still going to be struggle involved here. And it is on the very site of this fight that, that God is making his presence known and declaring this land sacred. And I think the point that I would take from this is that God turns battleground into holy ground. God turns battleground into holy ground. We've talked before about how God can take the very point of our struggle and turn it into the place where we see him the most clearly. I was reading an article this week that was going back and visiting pastors and Christians in Japan, marking the 10-year anniversary of the Fukushima disaster. And what was incredible was to hear all the ways in which God had taken that catastrophe and turned it around and used it as a way to really expand on the impact of the gospel in that country. Takeshi Takazawa, who is with Asian Access, said this. He said, small communities in the northeastern disaster area that had been notorious for limited receptivity to the gospel before 2011 have now recognized the presence and importance of the church. What they found also was that the church in general turned more outward than it had been before as it, it recognized its role in meeting the, the physical needs 
of each other and the world around them. And it expanded the church's capacity for compassion and engagement. And so that in turn impacted the way that the church went through the pandemic this time around. They treated it differently than they would have before. And I wonder for us, as we go through the pandemic, as we engage in this struggle, how is God using it to shape us as a church to grow our compassion, to turn us outward with the gospel so that we can be more effective at reaching this world for him? What does he have for us right here in this battleground that can turn it into holy ground? Well, look at this one verse that describes the state that Jericho was in as this battle was about to take place. Now, Jericho was tightly shut up because of the Israelites. No one went out and no one came in. Bit of trivia for you. Did you know that the macadamia nut has the toughest, hardest shell of any nut or fruit in the world? It takes 300 pounds per square inch to crack one open, which is probably why you don't normally get a bag of macadamia nuts in the shell. But I, I picture Jericho as being like a giant macadamia nut. It's just uncrackable. It's impenetrable. It's impervious to anything that, that comes up against it. You know, they had two layers of walls around Jericho, and some of those were six stories in height. So it would just be imposing to even look at. And I, I see that as a visual for the kind of battles we find ourselves in, where, where they just seem like they are locked down and nothing's getting out, and nothing's going in. We are not making any progress. You know, something that is old, that we've been dealing with for a long time in our lives, it's been there forever, and we just kind of go, I don't think I'm going to make any kind of progress here. Or maybe it's something that seems so big to us, it seems beyond our mental capacities or emotional capacities, and we just go, I can't deal with this. It's overwhelming. What do we do in those kinds of situations? You know, Paul talked about taking on, demolishing these strongholds in our lives. How do we do that when it seems like it is just on total lockdown? I think there are some things we could take from this story that are just really simple thoughts. But if you want to knock down a wall, I think the first thing is, to build a fence. Build a fence. God's unique strategy for bringing down Jericho was to have his people process in a parade all the way around the perimeter of the wall. Now Jericho was not that big of a place. It occupied maybe six acres total. And so scholars say that as this parade is going around with the ark out at front, that the ark would have completed its circuit and been back to the start before the last people in the parade had begun to walk around the city. And so you have this line of, of people entirely encircling Jericho. It's as if God is building a fence around the wall. And that's symbolically powerful just on so many levels because what it says is that God is bigger than this problem. God completely surrounds it. His presence had, had marched all the way around the wall. And so now what had loomed so large in front of Israel in the past, now they can see visually as they look around and see all their people all the way around it, they're going, oh, this isn't as big as we thought. And it begins to contain and confine Jericho back down to what it really is, what they're dealing with. And as they've walked around with God and looked up at it from every conceivable side, they also have some new perspective on themselves and see themselves as being smaller in relationship to it and understand their need for God to go into this battle. And they will have also put themselves up close to that wall enough that, that they've made themselves vulnerable to attack. And they've, they've risked that. They've had to trust God with the care of them all the way through that process. So here's where I'm going with this, is that as we come up against our own battles and struggles and walls, we can build a fence around them through prayer with God. We walk with God the entire circumference of what we're up against. We let him surround it entirely, and it begins to help put the problem back in perspective. It may not go away. We still have to deal with it, but it helps us see 
that God is bigger than whatever it is. It helps us, it helps us put it back under his authority and control to recognize it for what it really is. And, and we also, in that process though, we also begin to see ourselves with some new perspective. Because the more we pray about things, the more we're listening to his spirit, as we're talking to him about it, the more we will find ourselves aware of the places where we have maybe contributed to this struggle. Maybe we have been partially to blame or where we failed. And uh, that's humbling to see ourselves in a new way as we look at this problem and the reality of it uh, through prayer. And, and that means being vulnerable and getting close to the things that we really dread. Because I don't know about you, but I hate recognizing places where I've messed up and I've failed. And I know uh, I, I, I don't want things to be true about me. So I don't want to get close. But it's as I do that, as I can begin to really honestly look at the problem and myself, that I also can see that it's because God is there with me that this is even possible. And God is going to be the one who's going to fight this battle, not me. Because it's when I'm denying it and staying, staying further away from my own part in it, that I'm still holding on to this idea that this is my battle. Uh, and, and I'm asking God, are you on my side? And instead of saying, okay, I'm going to have to relinquish my power here and say, nope, you know what? I've messed up in this too. And I need God to be the one to fight this. What does it look like for you, whatever you're up against right now, to build a fence around it, to walk with God step by step, to stay close to it, but stay closer to him and to be, to be really bringing it before him in prayer. The second thing I think stands out from this passage is that uh, if we're going to knock down a wall, we need to wait like we mean it. Wait like you mean it. The Israelites didn't just have to march around the city one time. They had to do this every day for seven days. That feels really anxiety producing to me to think about being that close to this, this enemy encampment and to not know what's happening inside their city, what kind of battle plans they're drawing up, and when they might attack us from the walls at any given time. And to live with that day after day after day, I think by about day three, I'd be, I'd be done. I'd want to get out of there. I'd want to run away or, or just say, okay, let's just go ahead and attack now. But instead, they had to stay at it. And to me, the real victory in this story for Israel is not the walls coming down, but their ability to stay in that waiting period, to trust God so completely and not just act on some plan of their own to get this done. Uh, it is so hard for us to, to wait on God, and yet that is so often what he's asking us to do. Eugene Peterson said, One aspect of the world that I have been able to identify as harmful to Christians is the assumption that anything worthwhile can be acquired at once. Well, one final thing that I, I want to take away from this story is we're thinking about knocking down walls that we can see in Israel's experience is that we need to learn to anticipate. That is my very own awkward made up word. But what I mean by it is this. You go back to the beginning of the story and what was it that God had said to Joshua? He said, see, I have delivered Jericho into your hands. That's past tense. It's already done. This is before any marching has taken place, before any rocks have tumbled down from the walls. God says, I've done this for you already. It's complete. So now you get down to the end of this time as the Israelites make their last march around the wall and they lift up that shout as they were told to do, I don't think that is a war cry there. I think it's a victory shout. I think they are praising God for what he has done that they know to be true, that they haven't yet seen with their eyes. They are anticipating him. They are, they are lifting up his name. And as they do so, then the walls come down. You know, scripture says that God inhabits, he dwells in the praise of his people. 
And I think that is true for us as well. You know, sometimes we may look around and not see the reality of what God has done for us. It may not look like that's legitimate at all. But as we can anticipate, as we can praise him before it's evident, that action itself can be the place where we begin to see more of that. You know, Jerry Sternan once wrote, it's easier to act your way into a new way of thinking than to think your way into a new way of acting. So I might be caught up in all this fear and doubt of God and anger towards him and distrust. And it might feel like all that is standing in my way of praise and I need to get all that taken care of and sorted out first. When the reverse might be true instead, that, that I need to begin to go through the mechanics of, of acting on praise in order to get my heart to change. That I, that I lean into the things that I know scripture says are true about God that I even use the language of scripture when I don't have my own words and I begin to go through the motions of praise and let that begin to shape my heart rather than letting my heart shape whether or not I enter into that. So I anticipate praise. I do the praise first as an act of faith, uh, anticipating that God is going to show up and, and show me more of himself in the process. Pierre de Harcourt was part of the French resistance back in World War II, and he was captured by the Nazis and imprisoned. And it was really his faith in Christ that sustained him during that time. Listen to his own account of his experience. He said this, Beneath everything, beyond everything, I felt myself humiliated and defeated. I had been so confident, and now my pride had been laid low. There was only one way of coming to terms with my fate, by offering to God all that I had suffered. I must not only have the courage to accept the suffering he had sent me, I must also thank him for it, for the opportunity he gave me to find at last his truth and love. Then the inspiration came to me to kiss the chains which held me prisoner, and with much difficulty I at last managed to do this. Once my lips had touched the steel, I was freed from the terror that possessed me. As the handcuffs had brought the terror of death to me, now by kissing my manacles, I had turned them from bonds into a key. In the blackness of that night, my faith gave me light. There's an example of someone who recognized the battleground he was on was holy ground. And even before he could see God's hand in any of it, he adopted that unbelievable posture of gratitude and praise. And as he did so, God met him in such a powerful, profound way that it sustained him through all the rest of his imprisonment. Didn't make it go away, didn't make it end, but it shrunk it down. It, it built a fence around it because he could see that God was bigger than his circumstances. And I know many of you are up against some really tough circumstances right now. And as we face our own battles, so often the question that we want to ask first is, how am I going to win this thing? How am I going to beat this? When it's really an opportunity to say, I can't win this. I need Jesus' help. Because that's the, the true battle every time, isn't it? To get to that point where we can say, okay, God, I trust you. I am going to hand this over to your care. I'm going to believe that you are powerful enough and good enough and loving enough to take care of me in this. Can we learn to wait on him like we mean it? Can we learn to praise him and thank him even in the face of not being able to see what it is he's doing, just to trust that he is actually in control and has already won. My prayer for each of us is that we could see how God can take our battlegrounds and turn them into holy ground. God, may that be true for us. 
I know that uh, there are untold struggles happening right now on multiple levels for all of us. God, I only know a fraction of the stories out there, uh, but it's tough right now. It's tough just getting through every day. So God, I pray for strength for each person to, to first off be able to just lean in on you for that strength. God, to, to follow you around the perimeter of whatever it is that they are up against and to see it in perspective with themselves and with you there at their side to say, uh, you are the one who's going to get them through. God, would you, would you shrink our problems back down to the six acres that they are and not let them just take over all of our thinking? Help us see them in, in proper perspective. God, I pray that for us as a church as well. Some of the challenges that we face are daunting. We have many, many decisions ahead of us. And it would be easy to scramble and get strategic. God, help us learn to wait on you. Help us to praise you in the face of what we don't know and honor you and lift you up, God, so that we can see you transform all our battlegrounds into your sacred places where we can see you more clearly. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.